Annyeong Aseo! Welcome to Afternoon of Delight, where Leah, Megan, and Amy, romance novelists and your K romance guides. So grab some deck bokey and listen to your new favorite unease. Hey, everybody. Hello. Hi there. We're all together Yay. again. I was going to say, like, I'm here to keep things under control this week. <laughs> <laughs> To answer some listeners' questions, actually, there are some listeners asking if I listen to the podcast. First of all, I want to say thank you to Leah and Megan, because I had to duck out of our recording last week because of a health emergency with my daughter. She's okay, but it, I couldn't record last week. And so they took one for the team and recorded an episode by themselves. And some listeners were wondering today if I listened to that episode before it went live. And the answer is no. <laughs> It's been a busy week. And like, they just recorded it on Friday. We dropped it on Wednesday. I haven't had a chance to do it. And now I'm terrified to do it. Um, and I don't think that I will listen to that episode because I, I think uh, I'm better being uh, an ostrich with my head in the sand on that one. <laughs> but I trust my my Nunas, my afternoonas to keep things going, just as I know you two would trust, you know, the other two of us to do the same. And for those of you who appreciate the fact that I am back to police what gets discussed <laughs> today, you're welcome. There will be okay, no. I'm sorry, hold on no, one no, minute. No, 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 no. Don't even say there will be no, and then say the thing. <laughs> no, 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 just don't say the thing. So yeah, no, no toe sucking today. No, no, no. You don't oh, even, not even to, say to say it. it. Like, why do you even need to say no and then say the thing that nobody wants to hear about? And and nothing about my finger. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, no. Okay, well, let's talk about how I messed up today. Everybody messes up and it's fine. And nobody is upset about this. I know, but I feel really bad. Well, I, let me just say, I had like kind <laughs> of like a bad day. Like on, in my writer life, I screwed up like two big things today. So I was like not having a good day. So like I left the house and I was like, I'm going to go get like an iced coffee and like a treat because I'm just having a bad day. And, you know, came home, whatever, did some stuff. And then I realized, I was like, oh, we have our Patreon live tonight. So therefore, we're recording half an hour earlier. And I was like, I better tell the girls. But of course, I waited until 10, like, it was six minutes. minutes before. It was seven. It was it's six. Like, it was six fifty four when you texted me my time. You're like, just so, so you like, know, in 10 minutes, we're recording because yeah. we have the live. And I'm like, 10 minutes, like six minutes. And I'm sitting on the couch with my laptop watching Alchemy of Souls eating my dinner, towel on my head because I just got out of the shower after working out because I know I have until 730. I know. And then I'm like, holy fuck. And it should have been a red flag that that Amy wasn't aware because like Amy always knows what's going on. So it's like, yes. I, that should have been a red flag. Like, Amy, you need to question. <laughs> but I, I didn't, I didn't, but I didn't because it wasn't in the calendar, right? Like I looked, we have a, we have a shared Google, Google calendar and it wasn't in the calendar oh. at all in March. And usually I throw it in as soon as we schedule it. So I was like, well, shit, I forgot to put it in the calendar. Oh yeah. So then so I texted and then we're like, oh shit, Leah probably is like, cause Leah's like ending her work day when we were, yeah, I was, so I like, was doing kid pickups and in the middle of like some like extended family stress. And when I saw that you were like, Hey, just friendly reminder. I just figured because if anyone's going to blow a time, like, let's be real. It's going to be me every time. Like, we all know that. And so I just and I didn't have time because I was driving to see that, like, even Amy didn't know that would have given me pause. So I just assumed, oh, I messed up as per usual and came in and I didn't realize because, like, I think I've had too much coffee today. You know, family of origin issues can be triggering. And so when I sat down and realized that. I had not messed up. I did cry. You did. I felt so bad. Because he's like, because Leah thought, you even, wait, not, well, she thought not only did she mess up the times, she thought she made the yes. Patreon post for the wrong date. Right. Which, hello, whatever date we put in Patreon is the correct date. Like, we're right. Not correct. Right. We will honor whatever date we tell you is yeah. our live date. And so, and so yes. when she, she, you said you were like getting up the nerve to tell us you posted it wrong at Patreon, which you didn't. Yeah, because I looked at the Zoom to be like, okay, I've got to get the Zoom ready to go for Patreon, which we're recording yeah. after. And then I was like, oh, I'm a week wrong. And I was just like, oh, my God, everything just fell apart. Anyway, I don't really think anyone listening. This is boring radio. Let's be honest. Okay. Well, I know, but I just, <laughs> I guess just, you know, we all mess up. <laughs> it, like, we're, 
it's just, it's a day. It's a day. And I'm, I would have, I would have done a little something with the way that I look. <laughs> If, it looked, if I knew it was the Patreon live. So now it's in the calendar for next week and it's all good. And nobody fucked up so bad that we can't come back from it. But just so y'all know, we just are like scattered people with lives of our own. And this is our happy place. But sometimes we fuck up getting to our happy place. Yeah, right. So, it's just like, can I just talk about something that happened to me today that I thought was profound? And I wanted to give a thank you to you and the community for that's listening. Yeah, that's not about anything sucking anything okay good <laughs> you are banned from the word suck <laughs> in all of its forms uh, um so basically i was in a training today and it was actually a really insightful training for me because it it dealt with like wide-ranging topics from like having like compassion fatigue in like the kind of work i do because i'm in like a supportive in work environment where we have to give support to others to like burnout culture and it was kind of like a call to action on the idea of like radical self-care. And so radical self-care being essentially like the working definition as the imperative to um, resist pressures, to comply, conform, and to remain true to our authentic selves. And the whole time I was doing this, I just kept thinking, oh my God, like in the last two years, I really feel like I've been able to shift the needle on practicing radical self-care without even like knowing the term of it until more recently. And it simply has to do with things like this podcast, things like watching Korean dramas, things like getting into BTS, just all these things where I feel like being able to set aside that like need to like conform to like what other people would value or deem to be important and feeling like I authentically really like this has then allowed me to then be able to um, take care of myself and then have a way to take care of others. And so I guess like not to like pat myself or any of you on the back, but I really began to think about like, you know, the fact that we've talked before about how joy is resistance. And yeah, there was a quote from like the thing that I took a picture of and it was basically just like the slide said the importance of joy. And then it said allowing ourselves to be spontaneous or creative, playfully enjoying experiences, making new connections in the brain. This is an act of resistance. And I was like, I oh, my God, look at this. And I was just thinking again how, <sighs> you know, we're all caregivers because we're parents. Some people are caregivers who aren't parents. Some people just have to like walk through this world and not want to like murder everyone on a daily basis, which can be a challenge. And so having this just feels like a little bit of a secret weapon because I was like checking in with myself and like, do I get stressed? Yes. Do I like make mistakes? Yes. But I was like, I feel as if I have really defined places that I can now go to, to fill my bucket with, content that I know is going to make me happy connections that are going to make me happy both like you both then like folks that I've made friends with through the podcast through like talking to people in our patreon or who come through our feed all of it just feels really affirming and I just don't want to get used to that fact because I don't think a lot of people have access to things like this and that's what I wish that more people did because at the table I was with it was not a joyful table. Aww. And, um, and I just started to really be like, I don't want to take this for granted. Like, I don't want to take what we do for granted. And I don't want to take the people that we're interacting with for granted. Because honestly, I think that like, it's changed my life forever in profound ways. No, 100%. I, I thank you for that. Because I, I agree. And, you know, I said, you know, a few minutes earlier, I had professionally a bad day this morning. And normally I think I would have just had a complete meltdown and like cried. And instead I was like, you know what? I'm going to go get myself a coffee and a scone. And I was like sitting in the coffee shop waiting for my coffee. And I decided to watch clips from boys planet and like Pete time and stuff that I've been watching now. And I'm like in the coffee shop, like cracking up to myself like just finding joy in like stupid, wholesome, funny videos of like boys singing and dancing. And I'm like, you know what? I am so grateful that I have this, but then I'm even more grateful that I could sign on to Afternoon of Delight Instagram account and post about it 
Yeah. And there are listeners who are going to share in my joy. So like to re I'm, I'm like agreeing with what you're saying in that I love that I'm able to find my joy, but then the best part is like through this podcast that we found like other people sharing it, sharing it. And I know that I can like message like certain people, like certain listeners and be like, you know, share in this amazing performance with me that I just saw. And they're like, yeah, I know it was amazing. And I just love, I love that. And I agree. And I want, and then it makes me want that for other people. Like I want other people to have that joy too. Yes. It's just like, it was a happy accident that we found it, right? That we created. And we, I mean, I always talk about like this community that we've made, but like, it truly is like, I love that I get to see you two, you know, at least once a week, every week, but we're interacting on Slack every day. And then we're interacting with our listeners on social media every day, like to the extent where I love, you know, our, our loyal listeners who feel like they know us. And I think that you do in the extent that like, you know, I'll hop on Instagram today and I say I have a, a message from from Megan from Afternoon Army with a, a funny Rowoon clip because she knows that I love Rowoon and Aww. we can both love it together, you know, stuff like that. Or, you know, our listener Becky who will message me something about Gong Yu because, you know, when she first started watching Goblin, she was like, oh my gosh, I didn't understand, you know, that type of thing. She did the same thing to me with Lee Min Ho. She had seen him, I think she said she watched Pachinko and maybe something else. But then she started watching the King Eternal Monarch and like message me because she's like, Oh, my God, I get it now. And it's just sharing in those little like sort of epiphanies too. like, when Leah and I had first started watching, and we had only watched Crash Landing on You and Goblin. And I knew Megan was doing a lot with, you know, in the world of K pop. And I'm like, you know what, if you ever want to come over to the K drama side, just try Crash Landing on You and let me know what you think. And you went bonkers for it as, you know, as you should. And that's, that's really what started this all is the three of us then just got on this text chain and it made us the happiest when we were talking about dramas. And now yeah. we get to talk about dramas and K-pop and all of the things, you know, Korean entertainment with all of you. And it's, it truly is the best and I'm super grateful for it. Yeah. And it also makes me happy too when other people are like, Oh, well, I started doing this because of you. Like uh, I was messaging with a listener today on Instagram and um she was like, oh, I started watching Thai BLs like because of you guys. And then now she's giving me recommendations of ones I haven't seen yet. And I was like, this is great. Like I, you know, and I just love that. Like that exactly she found also the amazingness of what's out there. It's crazy. Once you get out of like what feels like small, like US centric Netflix, like once you get out of that, like the amount of content is crazy and into like all the other apps, which 10 cent app is on my shit list. <laughs> Let me tell you. All I wanted to watch was Love Mechanics because Allison from Afternoon Army is like, you got to watch Love Mechanics. It's my favorite BL. And I was like, okay, well, like, sign me up, you know? And I know mm -hmm. Allison loves angst. And I was like, okay, I'm in the mood for angst. I I will do this. Freaking Tencent app, you, like, have to, to, like, I watched episode one, but to watch any more, you have to be VIP. So I signed up for VIP, but it kept telling me it didn't recognize my, like, account. But, like, in my Apple subscriptions, it said I paid. It was like, basically, it was just like broken. Okay, it was like completely broken. Mm -hmm. So essentially, I had to wait for what was like my non subscription to run out. So I could sign up again. Which oh, my I God. Did, um, I did. So I had to wait a month. Meanwhile, Allison's like, did you watch it yet? And I'm like, Allison! <laughs> it's just my day. Did you get charged for it? No, I don't think so. Okay. You know, I don't even know. It was six bucks. And I, whatever. But anyway, I actually finally was able to re-sign up. And I was like, I'm not signing out of this, like, <laughs> like, watch this drama really quick, because this app might fuck me again. And Love Mechanics is like, it's A+, plus, A+, plus, A+. Plus. Super angsty, like, just drama around the corner every single time. It's it's great. Like, I freaking love Love Mechanics. So thank you, Allison. But I'm telling you guys, the Tencent app is like my villain origin story. But <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay. It's it, it was worth it. You know and what? that sucks because I have never had. I will say, like, not to like defend and you know, but no, you can I've defend it. No, no, I'm not. I'm just saying oh. I have not had that experience, so that was unfortunate because I've used it without any drama, and I'm like, look, if shit's to go wrong, it's going to go wrong with me figuring out some sort of app or technology. Yeah, well, and then it stopped letting me fast forward. I was just trying to fast forward through like the opening credits because like I don't need to see the opening credits every episode, so I was trying to fast forward. It just stopped letting me fast forward. 
And then I was like terrified it was going to shut down on me again, like in the middle of watching Love Mechanic. So this is a pay app and it doesn't work. Well, it doesn't. Apparently works for everyone else but me. So it might be user error. I don't know. But it's fine. I was able to watch it. I loved it. And now Allison is constantly sending me war. That's his name. uh, War thirst traps. Yes. From Instagram, and you know, I'm not sad about it. Just go ahead, Allison. I will accept this. <laughs> Netflix something... is the gateway. Netflix is right, the Netflix gateway. Is the ga- <laughs> but and there's so much of, else out there. Speaking of a drama that isn't joyful. <laughs> I mean, no. there's, well, a si- there's a sick element of joy. There's a sick element of joy. Right. Yeah. I was trying to think of a good segue. You know, I, I had one back when you said villain origin story, but then Leah kept oh, going after that, and I sorry. couldn't. I couldn't Don't tie it in. Or- well, can- I was going to say, is this a villain origin story? You know, is there anybody good in this drama? That's kind of what we're talking about today. And we are talking about The Glory Part 2. I think we should give a warning up front that this is The Glory Part 2. So there's not going to be a whole lot <laughs> without spoilers going on today. Because the only way you can talk about The Glory Part 2 is talk about the first eight episodes. So, right, you know, we'll do the best that we can. So pardon me while I get a little English teachery librarian-ish for a moment, because for those of you who don't know, for 21 years of my professional life, I was a teacher, I was a librarian, and I recently left public education, and I missed some things about it, like talking about literature. So some quotes on revenge. So the first one, I continued for the remainder of the day in my hovel in a state of utter and stupid despair. My protectors had departed and had broke the only link that held me to the world. For the first time, the feelings of revenge and hatred filled my bosom, and I did not strive to control them. But allowing myself to be borne away by the stream, I bent my mind toward injury and death. Like Frankenstein, I love that book, too. She's just giving herself over to it. It's very, a, it's very, a, uh, Mary don't Shelley own. wrote, Mary Shelley right. wrote that, but that is, that is the creature, right. Frankenstein's and creature. She wrote that when she was, like, 19. A teenager. Yeah. Crazy. Where they were having just like a contest, like who can write a gothic story. And that's what she came up with. Yeah. And she had that contest. Can we just nerd out because it's a fascinating moment? Go for it. Yeah. Do it. I I forget who she was with. She was with Byron, Lord Byron. She was with Shelly, who was married, but she was like adulterating with him. And then I forget who else, but they were like, had all kind of like gone to like the continental Europe. And they, uh, yeah, we're having this night of like romanticism and darkness and like plunging into the dark of the soul and who could come up with what. And these fucking dudes, like seriously, like nobody give her like any credit. And I will say that like as much as both of them are enduring, nobody has transformed fictional society like Frankenstein. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, like Shelley wrote like Ozymandias as his famous poem about like, you know, how fame doesn't last forever, essentially. And, you know, Byron's famous for just being fucking his sister, as we've talked about in the past, and being a bad boy and like doing all of his, you know, whatever. So I just, yeah, shout out. I just, and there's a book I really want to recommend and then we can get back to it. It's called Passion. It's maybe my favorite book. Um, and it's by Jude Morgan. I remember when you were reading this. Oh my God. It's all about the muses of romantic poets and Mary Shelley's one because she married Purse by Shelley who fucked her on her mom's grave, allegedly. Um, Cause her mom was a famous femi- early feminist and free thinker. I digress, but read passion by Jude Morgan. If you have any interest in unpacking the fictionalized, but like vaguely factual lives of famous authors, especially romance poets. Well, thank you because now I'm not nerding out by myself. <laughs> I can't, I mean, once we get to like that little cauldre of folks, I nerd out. Yeah. Someone want to read the next one? Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. William Goldman, The Princess Bride. So you guys are probably going to, I've never seen The Princess Bride. (gasps) (laughs) What? I admit that I haven't read it. I have the book, but I haven't read it because it's just never seen The Princess Bride. I've done both, but the movie. Megan, I'm fucking judging you. I, I know have it memorized. I have it memorized. Same, I will. Same. I will be honest. It's one of those. I will be honest. It's one of those that I just pretend like people like talk about it, and I like I'm that person in the background what? who's like, oh yeah, I remember that scene. No, but because I'm like, embarrassed. But why have you? Your not kids would love it. it. Your kids would love it. 
Uh, okay, I'll watch it with my kids. I have like, no I'm just gonna idea. Say, it holds. It holds up. It's ridiculous. It's like campy, and I. I mean, it's it's sleepy. amazing. No, but I don't disagree with you guys. I this is this is. I feel like this is something that I. I don't know. I just feel like I didn't you watch it. You need whenever... to experience Farm Boy Wesley. Okay. You know what? And I didn't Princess experience... Buttercup. I did not watch it in the eighties. I missed it when it came out the first time. So get your fucking ass in. There. I didn't see I... it in the theater. I definitely didn't see it in the theater. Okay. I saw it like on. VHS, I think. Yeah, I was watching it VHS in the '90s, but I mean, like, I came to it by my teens. I didn't. I think it came out when I was like younger than that. When did it come out? Actually, let's look this up. Uh, I know. And then know. during then during COVID, they did a COVID reenactment where people uh-huh. would just film their scenes like from yeah. their houses yeah. and like put on wigs, and it was amazing. I don't know. 19, was- 1987 is when it okay. came out. I don't know. I agree. I, I honestly, I'm like embarrassed about it. I don't know. It just was like one of those that just like it's time. slipped. No, it's time. Okay. And it holds up. It's cheesy. The effects are not good. It doesn't matter. It's no, just a- it doesn't I, matter. No, I, I, it's, I haven't, I haven't like avoided it. It's just been like one of those that just like never came into like my world. I don't know how to explain it. Has Neil know. seen it? I'll ask him. I mean, I want you to get up right now and go. I know. Seriously. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> I've never talked to him in my life, and I want to be like, "What is happening in your Neil?" House? Oh yeah, oh my god, are we gonna get to see Neil for the first <gasps> time? Neil, can you come here a minute? <laughs> this is like Bronte. Oh <laughs> this is like it, where this are is like you? Meeting a, it's like meeting. A Have celebrity. you seen the Princess Bride? He said no. <gasps> Does he know what it is? You two are you fired know what from it is? the human race. The movie you hear it referenced a lot. <laughs> yeah. Holy. Okay, okay shit. close my door now. Who he goes? Who's in that movie? Carrie, Robin. Carrie Wright. Elway's Robin Wright. Carrie Nanny Elway's Patinkin, from Andre the Giant. Carrie Elway's is is from uh, well, Billy Crystal. <laughs> Billy Crystal. Carol Kane. Neil said he's seen Robin Men in Tights. Does that count? No, no. Get Robin it. Hood Men in Tights is what Carrie Elway's in a Mel Brooks movie. This is a Rob Reiner movie. Wait, is. Karen Fred Elway Savage. Fred Savage is Fred so Savage. Cool. Little kid Fred Savage. Okay, close my door. I'm disappointed in the Erickson Hassels. <laughs> and if you are listening and you have not seen it, I'm pissed at you too. <laughs> Seriously, so it's fun. it's unforgivable. I know. I know. I know. I'm like okay. I'm looking I'm I'm just looking through Oh, Christopher Guest as the six finger man. <gasps> Again, I it's not I, I, I haven't I been just, avoiding it. Look, it has no it. no more rhyming, and I mean it. Anybody want a peanut? Want a peanut? <laughs> How about my wage? <laughs> my wage. My love way is not very. Two love. Okay, 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 okay. Let's. <laughs> I promise I will watch it, and I will let you. I'll watch do it. Do you know what? Do you know what this is? This huh. is inconceivable. I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> like, I knew. I knew that was like a movie quote, and it's like, of course, I don't know. It. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Okay, 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 okay. Okay, oh next God. one. <sighs> you read the next one. I don't care if you've never read The Count of Monte Cristo. You I actually have. Oh, okay. Okay, let me. <laughs> I actually, I know Alexander and Alexander Dumas is like. Dumas. Whatever. You don't Dumas. say yes. Okay. It's French. But I, I read, I read a lot of him. I read yeah. a lot of classics. I actually, yeah, I do, like, but... I, I love Count of Monte Cristo and The Three Musketeers. Yeah. Like, I love all that stuff. Yeah, and I've also read tons of Edgar Allan Poe, which is that has up. nothing to do with what we're talking about. Okay, today. that does not yeah. make and reading Edgar yeah. Allan Poe has nothing to do with not having watched The Princess. Yeah. And don't pretend like that's like making you somehow like intellectual. <laughs> I know <laughs> I'm not <laughs> clearly got the dates wrong today. I wish to be Providence myself, for I feel <laughs> that the most beautiful, noblest, most sublime thing in the world is to recompense and punish. Alexander Dumas, The Count of Monte Cristo. Wait, you have to do Crisco. the next one. You have to I do said the Crisco. Next. I said The Mount- <laughs> Count of Monte Cristo. I forgot the next one is Poe. I know. That's why I said. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I okay. thought you were just being okay. like an okay. okay. No, I was like, oh, I haven't read Poe, and that's why, because you have it listed next. Sorry. It's okay. Well, I'm going to read that one, too. Okay. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. Edgar Allan Poe, The Cask of Montiato. I love that story. I do too. Leah, I oh think you should do the next one. You have another freaking Princess Bride quote. <laughs> yes, I that's I'm saving that one for me. I get to do the last Princess okay. Bride one. So Leah, you do the Oh yeah, okay. Emily Bronte, so she should do that one. Yes. Yeah. 
My old enemies have beaten me. Now would be the precise time to revenge myself on their representatives. I could do it, and none could hinder me. But where is the use? I don't care for striking. I can't take the trouble to raise my hand. That sounds as if I've been laboring this whole time only to exhibit a fine trait of mag... Fuck. Mag... I can never say this word. That's a hard word. Magnanimity. Magnanimity. Oh my God, it's like my alpaca parka. (laughs) Magnanimity. It is far from being the case. I have lost the faculty of enjoying their destruction and I am too idle to destroy for nothing. Emily Bronte, Wuthering Heights. And as a disclaimer for myself, I do want to say that one thing is that I saw a quote once that made me feel really good about myself, which was, it's okay if you don't know how to pronounce some words because it means you learned it from reading. So you should actually be proud. So that's actually me. That's a hard word. Magnanimity. (laughs) Magnanimity. Alpaca parka. Alpaca parka. Okay. Another another Inigo Montaya. Yeah, Megan, let's get this one for you. No, Emily, uh, Amy wants to do it. I want to do it. I want to do it. And you go, she doesn't get, she does not get to quote the princess. (laughs) Are you kidding me? No way. (laughs) Boo. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like Cersei (laughs) walking like nude through the town and you're like throwing vegetables at me. Shame. They stole that from Princess Bride. Pretty much. Just Mm -hmm. saying. Just saying. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I've been in the revenge business for so long. Now that it's over, I don't know what to do with the rest of my life. Again, William Goldman, The Princess Bride, another Inigo Montaya, because his whole story was revenge. And that's kind of where we are right now with the glory, right? Like, if you have built your whole life on revenge, then what comes next? What made me laugh with with looking up all these quotes is that before we started K-Drama, I didn't know that I was a revenge fan. And then, you know, we found K-Drama and I realized that some of my favorites, like Edamon Class, Lawless Lawyer, and The Glory, I really enjoyed. Like, I I like a good revenge story. Reading one, you know, watching one, it's been a lot of fun. So, you know, like I said before, you know, this is a part two. So we are going to talk about The Glory Part 1 here. So if you haven't watched, you know, The Glory Part 1, we'll let you know when we get to all the spoilery stuff. But let's just generally talk about what do we like in revenge stories? Do we like revenge stories? What do you guys think? Yeah, I love how in the script, after my name, Amy wrote, here comes John Wick, which is so funny, because we actually were talking about John Wick, because the movie <laughs> comes out, like, very, the fourth John Wick comes out. It like, comes out tomorrow. Soon. And I'm, like, a, just a massive, massive fan of that franchise. But, yeah, I mean, we talked about before that revenge stories are always, always going to um, entice me. I just, I love them. I, I write them a lot in my own work because i just i just i'd love a good revenge story i mean yeah i've oh i what most of the revenge k dramas i've probably seen if there's one i haven't let me know and look i would think no but then when i think about it yes (laughs) so um i mean the princess bride is a revenge story in mostly the a story and the b story i was gonna say both of them Yeah. yeah and i'd say it's one of my like all-time faves also, I love Star Wars, and I feel like Star Wars has a lot of revenge happening. In it. I mean, no, I think revenge is... I like revenge. I mean, I love Game of Thrones. That was all revenge. Everything, nope. As I keep going, I loved at least the first season of Westworld, Revenge. Oh, so, my God. The first season of Westworld was so good. I know. I don't want to talk about how it fell apart, but yeah. I liked the open... I loved the first season, and that's yeah, all revenge. Good. So, no, I, yeah, I actually quite like revenge. I guess we all do. And like I said, I was surprised to realize that I did. But like, like I said, all the the literature that I pulled from was stuff that I'd either read or seen. And I love it all. So, so when we're talking about the glory here, the first eight episodes dropped a couple months ago, and we covered those. So this episode is going to cover this episode of the pod is going to cover episodes nine through 16 of the glory, which just dropped a couple weeks ago. But like I said, we can't talk about the second half without talking about the first half. So basically the spoilers start here since we have to recap part one to move on to part two. If you want to stay great, if you want to pause and watch, that's great too. Netflix does offer some trigger warnings in the topics listed for the drama, but we'd like to reiterate that the drama does contain excessive violent bullying, sexual assault, attempted suicide, and murder, just to name a few. It's not an easy drama to watch, but if you can handle all of that, then you are in for one 
Wild Ride by one of our faves, Kim Un Suk. So basically, this ends the spoiler-free section of today's episode. Sorry. <laughs> you have been warned. Okay? All right. So I've got a quick little recap written here that I thought we could all take part in. And so why don't we just kind of move on down the line here? I'll do the first one. Mm-hmm. So Moon Dong Un was viciously bullied as a teen by Park Yun Jin, the ringleader. A Jun Jae Jin, Lee Sara, and Choi Hai Jung and Sun Myung Oh. Those are all of her bullies. So Dong Un drops out of school at 19 and dedicates her life toward getting revenge on those who wronged her. So Yoon So E, another girl bullied by the same group, died supposedly by suicide. But So E's mom has always insisted it was murder. And a kindly doctor and hospital director at the hospital where she was pronounced dead took it upon himself to keep the body frozen. I have some questions. As one does. This. Yeah, I mean, rather, <laughs> rather than let it decay, just in case any new evidence came to light. <laughs> Kindly doctor gets murdered in the ER, and his med school son embarks on the road of vengeance himself. <sighs> in the present, Dong Un is well into her revenge plot, having scored a job as Yun Jin's daughter's teacher and having become a worthy adversary in playing Go with Young Jin's husband, Ha Do Young. Dong Eun has accomplices. Kong Hyun Nam, a woman being abused by her husband, and Ju Yo Jong, the murdered kindly doctor's son, who <laughs> is on the road of vengeance himself, and now in love with Dong Eun. The bully crew knows Dong Eun has returned to exact her vengeance. And Myung Oh of the bully crew has gone missing and is suspected to have been murdered. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think that covers it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that is the glory part one. And there's so much more that comes after that. So yeah. here we go. Speaking of, you know, starting out part two, what were your thoughts going into episodes nine through 16? Like, were you rooting for Dong Un, rooting against the baddies, or maybe just having hot daddy dreams about Do Young? <clears throat> I can jump in really fast and say that, <laughs> you know what? I was rooting for Dong Eun and I was pleasantly, like, I was hyped. Like, season one went well for me. I was really enjoying it and I was excited to see where we were going. And I felt like I was ready for this, like, fucking masterful takedown that was going to be, like, sheer wit undoing, like, all the harm done. I will not say I feel like. <laughs> We'll get into it. I'm going to say I'm lukewarm at best, but were the baddies bad? Yes. In a fun way. Was that daddy (laughs) just a fucking zaddy? Yeah. (laughs) So I mean, like it's hard because look, I, I, I think the plot ultimately failed to execute for me. However, there were elements enough that I enjoyed that I kept going that I'm happy I watched it. I don't know why I made my voice all quiet. Like I'm like feeling bad. Like, no, I didn't really like it, but I was rooting for Dong Eun. I think the script let her down. So I was rooting against the baddies for sure. The actors who played the bullies were just so good. Like they were awesome. Like, (laughs) like I just love this bully friend group. I mean, like I, I love to hate them. Like I really enjoyed disliking them. And it was just so satisfying to, like, watch them unravel. And as much as I really did love this drama, like, I did, I loved it. Um, there was there was still sl- something slightly missing for me with Song Hai Kyo's performance. And you know what? Maybe it was the script. Like, maybe I'm putting too much on Song Hai Kyo for this. Maybe if I, 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 you know, now that Leah said she thought that the script let Dong Eun down, maybe that was my issue. I don't know. But she's just not, she's not my favorite. I do think she was much better in part two than part one, but I, this is, I think the baddies were just so, so bad and caused so much pain for like so many people that Dong Eun's revenge started to not feel as personal for me anymore, which sounds crazy because she has like burns all over her body, but I don't know. It just started to like almost like get away from her. Maybe I don't know. And she would just kind of like show up and like smirk at people. I don't, so it was like a weird (laughs) thing. And I know I shouldn't compare. 
because in my name, I was basically 100% rooting for Han So He's character. And so I feel like that was always in the back of my mind where I was, or, or even in Itawan class, I was like, I was rooting for Park Zero Wee yes. rather than like the downfall of the baddies. Yes. And so maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe I just, and it didn't, to me, it did not lessen my enjoyment. It's just that the question was, I'm answering the question. Who are you rooting for? <laughs> right. Yeah, it was a good question because uh, I do think there's 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 a difference. Han yeah. So-E's, my name is different too because her revenge is strictly personal. So obviously like, Dong Un is also, she's trying to like bring justice to So-E's murder as well. Right. So there's there's some more elements to it. So, and it, you know, and in uh, my name, I felt like the baddie was, there was more of a gray area there. Whereas the glory, the bullies were just like straight up terrible, selfish people. <laughs> um honestly they were like and i was fine with that like in but this they, acted drama, their asses, they acted their they asses did. off oh my god so I, I like i didn't need them to be sympathetic i really don't no. Like to me the drama felt like a very indulgent revenge drama yeah i mean i'm i'm kind of agreeing with what you both are saying about um dong un's character like i was totally rooting against the baddies but i think that the way that her character was written for her to be so closed off and not make any emotional connections with anybody that it was hard to, it was hard to feel the empathy for her that you wanted to feel right. Like you, right. like it was, it was horrible what happened to her. Mm -hmm. And I wanted justice to be, you know, I wanted these people to be brought to justice, but I did not have an emotional connection to her side of the revenge. Oh no. Yeah. See, no. I did like, so this is where it's funny. Cause I did. However, I don't feel like she was able to get that revenge on her own. I feel like as we're going to unpack, it was a series of big coincidences that really a series of fortunate her. events. <laughs> yeah, a series of very fortunate events that got her there, <laughs> not her. Because I mean, like she filled her fucking apartment with photo. It was like the tinfoil hat with like the red strings. And that's not what solved anything, I feel like. I mean, like she No, it didn't. Gas, she set a little gas on the fire, but like I don't think that it was like yeah, I think I think all like, of them were going to they were they're all going to like implode somehow. I but if she had spent her entire like what, 20 years plotting this revenge, like I'm like, I'm I don't, I don't really know what you did. <laughs> like, fair. Yeah. It is fair. It is fair. But can we I mean, like the can we just give a slow clap to Jung Sung Il and a hot, hot oh. over 40 hero. The best. He was the so best. good. So I, I need him in a hundred more dramas as a yeah, hero. and I don't want him in a rom com. I want him in some sort of intense, angsty yeah. drama where we get like that, like dressing room closet makeout scene that he had with his wife. Like I want that. I want to see hero. him stick his finger all the way down someone's mouth. Oh my god! Why? <laughs> why? Why can't you stop? Yeah, like intrusive why? thoughts, just intrusive thinking. They don't need to be intrusive words. <laughs> my inside thoughts are my outside words. <laughs> don't oh tell me God. it wouldn't be hot. Don't. I tell loved me it him. Be hot. I did. I loved him a lot, and I loved him so much. And Best daddy. I don't want to. I'm not going to spoil anything for other dramas, but I will say, like we watched him in something else recently, where he was a very different character and did not appeal to me at all. Like that just goes to show like what a great actor someone can be that you can be totally turned off by them in one role and turned on by them big time in another. Yeah. I, cause I was like, what else has he been in? And I looked and he was in a drama that I would just seen. And I was like, what was he in this drama? And then I, I like, it didn't, I did not connect at all. Like it was, it was like, yeah, like nuts to me. All right, so we're going to pause already for a K-pop rec because really we're just diving into part two. So we're going to break and Megan is going to give us our K-pop rec of the week. What do you have for us? I am so excited because I chose this song specifically for The Glory, part two. Um, and this is actually a song. It's called Vengeance and it's by, it's either BB or Bibby. I'm not sure. It's just B-I-B-I. -I. And she's like a soloist. And I have wanted to recommend this song for a while because I really like it. I just had, like never had fallen into the schedule or whatever. And then I noticed that there were like tons of edits on Instagram of the glory and like Dong Un using this song. And it's very appropriate. So like, again, the title is called Vengeance. 
And um, I'm just gonna, there's a couple lyrics that you'll see why people are using this song. And obviously the, the song is in Korean. There's a few like English lyrics, but it's mostly in Korean. But um, the main chorus, she says, bad bitch, just a real bad bitch. And she says it over and over again. And then she says, don't ever get caught again. You'll then see the crazy bitch. And it's like perfect. It's perfect with like stills of Dong Un like exacting, exacting her revenge. The entire music video of this song is fantastic. Like I just, I need you all to listen to it because the vibe of this song makes you want to take a pencil out of your hair and stab someone in the neck. Like trust me, <laughs> it's fantastic. So yeah, check it out. It's Vengeance uh, by Bibby and. I know you'll like it. I watched the video. It was awesome. This video of this yeah. song? It's yeah. so good. It's oh, yeah, because I posted it in Slack. Yeah. So good. So good. If you enjoy our podcast, you have our patrons to thank, at least in part. Afternoon of Delight Patreon allows us to keep creating content for y'all to enjoy. Thank you so much to everyone who is supporting us there. And not to brag, but our Patreon community is pretty awesome. And you can join at a tier that feels good to you. Gain access to fun perks like K-drama posts, monthly Patreon-only bonus podcasts, and even a live K-drama support group on Zoom. Because we know firsthand what it's like to have no one to talk to about those crazy plot twists, amazing characters, and all those feelings. And look, no one should have to walk that walk alone. So learn more by visiting afternoonadelight.com. That's www.afternoonadelight.com. And hey, while you're on the website, you can check out Afternoona Delight podcast merch, find links to book recommendations, bop along to our K-pop recs, blow up your skin with K-merch recs, find all of our social media and a link to our email so you can send us recommendations or feedback. And hey, while you're at it, why don't you pop over to Spotify or Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review? It really helps with our discoverability. Gamsamnida. So what kinds of things do you both like to do when you drive? Pay attention to the road? Is this a trick question? All right, how about when you fold laundry? Why am I folding laundry in this scenario? Read, friends. I was trying to get you to say read. You could just ask us if we like to read when we drive or... Wait, how are you reading when you're driving? With Audible. You know, our sponsor, who is the leading creator and provider of premium audio storytelling, enriching the lives of millions of listeners every day. I listen to audiobooks on my commute to work, in the car. Oh yeah, I totally do that. I love my Audible subscription. Then why'd you leave me hanging with the whole driving thing? Forget it. It's not important. What is important is that now our listeners can get a 30-day free trial of Audible Premium Plus from Afternoon of Delight. Do you know what they get with that free trial? Actually, I do. They get one audiobook credit, two if they are Prime members, which is good for any premium selection, and they get to keep that audiobook. They also get the whole Audible Plus catalog of podcasts like Afternoon of Delight, audiobooks, guided wellness, and audible originals. And with the Plus Catalog, you can listen all you want, no credits needed. And Audible sends you a reminder email before your trial ends. Sounds like a great way to spend 30 days to me, especially if you're heading outside for a walk, have a long commute to work, or just want to hear one of many talented narrators really bring your book to life. All you have to do is go to www.audibletrial.com slash afternoona to sign up and you're ready to download your first listen. Enjoy! So let's talk Yoon so because this became a big part of the drama in the second half. First, I love that our unrequited love contestant from Singles Inferno 2 got some good screen time in the second half, but seeing how she died, Yoon Jin setting fire to her sweater and then watching Zoe back up and over the edge of the building's roof was kind of brutal, as was all the torture inflicted upon the other girls Yunjin bullied. We do see in the past and present that Yunjin is nothing but a burden for her mother, a problem to solve. Did the unfolding of Yunjin's backstory ever make her sympathetic or is she evil through and through? Uh, yeah, no, I was not, I was never sympathetic to her. (laughs) 
I mean, I, I did either. start. Yeah, I did start to see that she was obviously like kind of a jealous, insecure person. But she also really enjoyed ho- holding power over others. Like she got a lot of enjoyment over that. Like cruelly um, doing it. Yeah. I mean, once we got more into her, like the backstory with her mother, who is a terrible person, I started to see more part of why Yunjin is the way she is. But I don't think her being that way was inevitable with that mother. Like, I think she easily could have been a better, a better person. I, I, she could have been a good person with a terrible mother. Instead, she was like an absolute monster with a terrible mother. I just, there's to me getting, enjoyment out of burning someone with a hair straightener that's not a normal no person like that there you have some wires in your brain that have been frayed like that's just i almost don't think the mother had anything to do with it i think that showing her backstory a little bit and showing her situation with her mother made her and dong on good foils for each other because they both grew up with horrible unloving mothers Mm -hmm. and turned out differently, right? And so that kind of goes to what you're saying, like, did the mother really have anything to do with it? Or do you at some point, you know, have a misfire (laughs) in your synapses and decide the only way that you can feel secure is to cause pain to others? Yeah, that's And like, Dong Un didn't go that route. And she was, you know, she was treated horribly too. So what I've seen, and Again, I'm not like a clinical psychologist and I know we have people with therapeutic backgrounds who watch the show so they can weigh in on this. But I've seen quotes that say something along the lines of, and I mean, like, this is a very convenient quote, but kind of that psychopaths are made and sociopath psychopaths are born and sociopaths are made. So basically that triggers from an environment in childhood can kind of help create these like full blown symptoms of sociopathy. And I just want to go through a couple of the traits of sociopathy because I was going to ask, I was just going to ask, can you, can you like outline the differences between psychopath and sociopath? Um, Yeah. Well, first let me get into like um, sociopath traits would be like a hunger for power and dominance. And then what it says is that like sociopaths tend to be kind of like power hungry and spend a lot of time and effort attaining positions where they can control dominant dominate and like be in charge devious and deceptive tendencies ruthlessness in pursuit of their goals hostile and aggressive towards others easily angered and irritated irresponsible decision making superficial charm and powers of persuasion broken moral compass and limited conscience few close bonds or relationships manipulative tendencies entitlement and impunity socially deviant so like no regard for social norms or moral codes cheap thrill-seeking tendencies like maybe overindulging in sexual affairs opportunistic in all the wrong ways and emotional detachment so these are just like pulled from a list from a website called choosing therapy but i think that it kind of outlines pretty neatly that uh we're dealing with like a sociopath here. And then to your question about um, sociopaths versus psychopaths, um, like when I look at like Web- WebMD or something like that, it talks a little bit about um, is that a psychopath doesn't have a conscience. So they don't feel any moral qualms, even though they pretend to. Whereas a sociopath typically has a conscience, it's just really weak. So they're going to know that taking your money is wrong, but they're not going to stop their behavior with it. Both seem to lack empathy. And I guess like kind of like what I'm seeing is that like sociopaths are seen as more like being like hot headed and acting without thinking of how others are going to be affected. Whereas um, a psychopath, is basically just like manipulating people for personal gain in a more like cold hearted and calculating way. So, I mean, those are kind of like inelegant definitions, but I would say that like what we're dealing with, you know, with um, Yunjin is I'd say she's hot headed and impulsive. She's not coolly sitting back and just kind of like, I'm going to figure out how to get mine. It's more like reactive with like a very low moral compass and knowing often 
what they're doing is wrong and kind of like building this bigger house of cards, like to like try to like look like you're like the good girl within it. That's her to the T. Like, like when so yeah. when Zoe falls off the building, immediately Yunjin starts hysterically crying, calls her mom, I need help, something happened, you know, and trying to cover up the way that it happened. Yeah, that's a really great. But she's feeling sad for herself. Exactly. She said that she said that she could get in trouble for yeah. what she did. Where, as I feel like, and I think there was a moment of like, oh, fuck, too. Like, this right. really did go too far. But now, whereas like a psychopath, I feel like could watch them fall and be like, okay. And then like go home and like manufacture that situation. I feel that, um, you know, I feel like there was genuine emotion there that was happening. It just wasn't like. For herself. Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Correct emotion. Yeah. I honestly, I don't know if I, I honestly wouldn't call her a sociopath. I think she's more of a narcissist than anything. I don't know really? that I call her like a fool. Yeah, I, I just I feel don't. like everything I just went through was like exactly a checklist of her character. I do too. I'm, I mean, I'm I, not trying to argue against you. I'm just no, saying that I thought that fit her I know. Well. Well, I mean, no, I'll also, argue against you. I'm happy to argue against you. Well, I mean, we're also <laughs> diagnosing like a fictional character, but I just, And we're not, yeah, therapeutic experts. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, I think she was just. But she took joy in causing physical harm That's and wielding true. power. Whereas narcissisms would be like, I just want everyone to love me. And That's like, true. I'm really self-focused. It was like the, it was the, yeah, I mean, I know I just said that I think there was some synapses. I mean, I do. I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess you're right. I don't know. I, think, I shouldn't say this, but it makes me feel like we're giving her like a pass for being a shitty person. I guess I just am like, she, I, I don't think it's a pass. I think okay, it's no, just an explanation. It's, yeah, no, it's an I explanation for her for her tendencies, but it doesn't give her a pass. Well, I mean, like, okay, serial killers usually like are falling diagnos- not, but diagnostically, I think, into like some of these areas, like psychopathy or sociopathy, and I don't think we're like, oh, well, the poor, like, they have this like diagnosis. Poor, we're like, no, poor, yeah. poor person with bad brain chemistry. Yeah, like, like poor, yeah. Te- poor Ted Bundy had like a screw fucking. Yeah, that's true. Missing. That's true. That's true. So no, I don't think it gives her a pass. I think it just gives a clear explanation of her tendencies. It doesn't. Okay. I don't think it excuses them at all okay. to fictionally diagnose her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So speaking speaking of uh, moral compass, let's talk about morality based on the outcome of the drama. Dong Un's revenge ends with Myung Oh dead at Yeon Jin's hands. Mostly. More on that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Jae Jung first blind at Hai Jong's hands and then dead at Do Young's hands. Hai Jong unable to speak, although she can make noise, after Sarah John wicks her in the neck. Sarah in prison, I think. I don't even like. I can't even keep this all straight. Yun Jin in prison. Yun Jin's mother in prison. Hyun Nam free of her abusive husband after Yun Jin's mom runs him over. Dong Un's mom locked up in a psychiatric hospital or rehab center or something um, after setting fire to Dong Un's apartment. Uh, Do Young and Yi Sol off living their lives. And Dong Un and Yo Jung now working at a prison, her as a teacher and him as a doctor, in order for him to finish what he started in avenging his father's death. <laughs> that sounds so confusing. It's, and it's not. Well, it, it, and like, if you watch the, but it's a lot. It's a it's, lot. <laughs> But wait, but wait, <laughs> remember when I said more on that in a minute about yeah. Yunjin murdering Myung Oh? Well, the big reveal at the end is that he was still alive when she left him for dead. And he begged Yang Ren, the girl who runs the department store and lives in the tiny connected room <laughs> in the store, right where this all went down. Coincidentally. He Coincidentally, yeah. he begs her to help him, but we get a flashback to him forcing himself on her sexually. And when the bloody Myung Oh grabs her ankle in the present, she grabs the unbreakable liquor bottle that Yun Jin yeah. used to bludgeon him and gives him the final fatal whack. The final fatal whack. <laughs> I love it. Everyone other than Yi Sol and Hyun Nam's daughter, Sana does at least one very bad thing in this drama. So who is good and who is evil? <laughs> Leah. I mean, I guess I'm just trying to think about like, what is the nature of good and evil? And here, do you want to know my honest answer? Mm-hmm. I think yeah. your quest, 
I think your question is too smart for how dumb this drama got. (laughs) (laughs) Because I don't think this drama ultimately becomes to me a meditation on good and evil. I think it becomes, (laughs) I, I mean, honestly, I think it's a hot fucking mess on the back half. Like I couldn't believe how ridiculous I felt like I, I, I thought, I don't know why I trusted I was on a train that was going somewhere. And in the end, I was just like on train tracks that were going like every which way. And then like kind of had a lesson. In the end, I was like, what, what am I meant to like take away here? So I can't, I mean, honestly, I don't, I'm going to pass on this because I don't think that, I don't think that this drama satisfactorily answered that question for me. I feel like it just in the end went for shock value as opposed to like thematic connections. That's fair. That's fair. I I will say that I enjoyed it more than you did. I did too. I I did enjoy it, but I enjoyed it because it turned, it went like Mok Jong territory for me. Yeah. Yeah. And I I felt like the end of, I don't want to spoil for anyone who hasn't seen, but it felt to me like the end of Little Women where there was like that kind of like crazy joy. So yeah. 100%. 100%. If I do in that space. So going, going back to my ultra literary quotes in the beginning, it, it does make me think of, uh, Inigo Montaya's, you know, quote at the end of the Princess Bride, where he's like, I've spent my whole life, you know, getting revenge now that it's over. I don't know what to do with myself. And that's kind of how I felt about, you know, our supposed like hero and heroine at the end. Because that, that's that's their happily ever after is that now they're embarking on his revenge story. That, like it just doesn't like what what are they going to have to do after he kills the, do the we, guy who's do on we, death row? It's just like domino of revenge. Do we have yeah. questions? Do we have any questions about the stupidity of that and how if there's a second season to Glory, I'm going to burn down Netflix. <laughs> I don't even know what they would do when she's they like. Such- and- yeah, I was like, we're literally going to just end this. Like, is this if this becomes sequel bait, who gives a f- flying rat's ass about the psycho in the prison? Like, well, what's fun about just watching him torture some guy in prison? Who wants to watch <laughs> no, who's, on, who's on death row? Like, like I don't. No, there's nothing. It I it makes no sense to me why that. No, became and I think a- I think that would have given the drama more of a message is if he would have been like, you know what? I have seen how this has torn you apart devoting your life to this and I am going to I'm going to get my revenge by living my fucking life and and not going down the same road you know there's one plot that would make sensible (laughs) sense here the other thing is that like I think I would look over and be like don't you spent decades plotting a revenge that only succeeded because of like random frozen but I mean like it was ludicrous the amount of coincidental things that had to happen a random frozen corpse <laughs> oh no young jin's mother hitting hyun ran's <laughs> husband was like the most coincidental. but like, that was planned thing. but how was it planned <laughs> the shaman called him there that was yeah, planned between would, her and the how shaman would you <laughs> How would she be driving? Just he would be crossing. I know it was it was perfect that, timing. No, it was saying. perfect timing. That's but the accident, know. but the accident wasn't a coincidence. How well it worked out was a coincidence. And, yes. and the fact well, that he hit him, the fact that another car didn't hit him first. You know what? No. I think what you I think what you just said sums it up because we're meant to see that like I think Don Un was like some sort of like mastermind to this, and like did it work out? Like did all the baddies get their comeuppances? Yes. Yeah. Did she set things in motion? Kind of. <laughs> did she like took themselves down? Right. She was yeah, the analyst I mean, for their unraveling. Like, did, and she, so, did she know that Sarah was going to stab Hai Jung in the neck? Like, so, and I mean, I think we're meant to think like, you know what? Good for her. She could keep her hands kind of clean while like the baddies take them out. But what's good in a revenge drama is like, think of like Kill Bill, where she like fucking takes them down one at a time or where... You know, like Inigo Montoya, when it's like, you killed my father. He trained his whole life and then freaking stabs the dude. Sorry, Megan. (laughs) But like, you know, you deserve deserve to be spoiled. He gets his revenge and he takes active roles. So, I mean, there is some something interesting to think like you set a catalyst emotion. So your ultimate plot 
is that like the baddies will just take themselves down. But it wasn't even like it felt smart. Like she's like, I'm just going right, to keep that wasn't adding, her plan. I'm going to keep adding like little bits of gasoline and just watch this from the side. Like blah, blah. she was just kind of like st- at one point I was like, oh, my God, she's just stumbling through this. And it's just fucking all working out. That's how it felt to me. Like, I, again, I still wildly enjoyed it. But I, but I don't, uh, and I think that that was why I started to like just not even be like rooting for Dong Un anymore. Instead, I was like rooting against the baddies because I was just like disconnected from her revenge because it, it turned into it turned into more of like the infighting among the baddies, right. which would because again she couldn't have predicted which I that enjoyed Sarah, me too, mm-hmm. but she couldn't have predicted that Sara was gonna stab Hai Jung in the neck and render her. But the, and then Dong Un acted like she had this all planned. I'm like, how could you have known that that was going to happen? Because then she goes to Hai Jung and tries to get Hai Jung to blind Jae Jun, which she did. But like all of that was obviously very coincidental. So it felt like this is where Kim Un Suk I feel like has a good idea sometimes in writing, and I think in this case it was going to be like. Somebody comes back with their revenge and the baddies destroy themselves in like the process of the revenge. I think that was like the intent, truly. But I think it was done badly. And the only correlation I can draw to it is, and this isn't a spoiler, this is just like a nod to another drama she wrote, which is King Eternal Monarch, where Agreed. so much time and energy is put towards the bridge that passes between universes <laughs> and it ultimately meant nothing. I felt like that's how Jung Un's revenge plot met. I, like, felt like it was hyped up to mean something so big, and like all the photos and everything set up. I was like, "Oh my god, we're going somewhere that's gonna be awesome!" And I'm like, "No, the plot actually didn't take us anywhere except, yeah, no." I mean, yeah, that's fair. Again, I think I was watching part two in like a fever dream of bloody revenge. Yeah, like so much shit happened in part two. I mean, crazy shit that made me think Kim Un Suk was like working something out, like (laughs) working something out against someone who did her wrong. Okay, because the shit she put these like baddies through, like this is the thing. I (laughs) I don't know what I was thinking. I guess I thought in part one, I was like, okay, she's gonna like ruin their reputations. Like Yunjin will get divorced, and like she won't be able to work anymore, and like. You know, Sara won't be some like famous artist and Jae Jun will maybe like lose his store. Like, I, I guess I wasn't realizing like how far this was going to go. <laughs> like, I mean, I mean, Sara like masturbating while on she's the high. Altar, while she's high on the <laughs> altar of her father's church while everyone videotaped her took me out. Like, I was like, this is where we're going. This is where we're going. <laughs> and like, Oh, okay. We're not just like, we're not, not like hurting their reputations. We are like absolutely destroying these people because, because, because it didn't end there. Like her, she got it worse and then we're blinding people. Like, <laughs> I mean, and I even kind of like, look, I will say one thing I like is when she did, you know, come up with like the whole thing with Jae Jun, you know, getting blinded by Hai Jung. Like, I was like, there's, there's like some active choice there. Like, here, take the thing and mm-hmm. you do my dirty work. Mm-hmm. And if that had just happened over and over again, I would have been fine with it. In this case, I just felt like it just got so, yeah, I just, I really felt like we lost Dung Un and her agency and just her as a character. I honestly just felt like her character just kind of like became unimportant. And the other thing is that like, I really, really, really hated Yo Jung's character. <laughs> like, I well, realized I forgot at the end, you, Yeah, you said. I think that, like, there was no point to him at all. At all. I feel like it would have been such a more satisfying and, like, inter- like if I if I could be in charge, I would have um, Do Young, the da- hot daddy. Right. I would have had her, like, you know, going to like kind of like entrap hot daddy and be like, you're going to be part of my plan. And then through like sad go games and whatever, they like develop some sort of a relationship. We didn't I would have to totally have, been down for that. We didn't need to have this like fucking camp out, like <laughs> under a <laughs> That was really thing. weird. Living in a tent, tent in his giant house where I'm sure yeah. he had another room. <laughs> and he had no point. I felt like really to the story, except to have some more revenge and a story that honestly wasn't that interesting. Like, okay, a bad fucking psycho killed your saintly dad. Like who? Okay. Like 
I feel like we rehashed that so many times that I was like, I don't, I literally have stopped care. I'm sorry, kind doctor. I don't give a shit anymore. Like we have beat your death to as dead of a pulp as you were beaten to and you died. I think, so here's the thing. I think maybe you were expecting more from the drama than I was. I think that, that <laughs> no, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Like you mm-hmm. wanted, I will she say. She wanted a smarter, on, you wanted a smarter drama. Yeah. On the pod, I'm probably like the least fan of Kim and Sook. So like, well, I really like Mr. Sunshine. So I'll take that back. Like, how did she write I that? I like Goblin too. How did she write that? How did she like, write Kim? Mr. I do Sunshine admit. Radically connected a complicated plot. Right. And then wrote, yeah, I get it. See, the thing is towards part two. And again, I didn't connect with Dong Un in part one. Like I said that in the pod. Like yeah, see, I did I like- not like Song Hai Kyo's performance. I was not connected to her. So I didn't really care that she faded into the background. All I wanted at that point was to watch the baddies unravel and I got it. So mm-hmm. I was satisfied. But I get and and it it, tur- it totally did turn into a mockjong for me, but I I liked it. Like I liked that it just I went too. off the rails. Like when <laughs> like when Dong Un this isn't funny, but when she was like <laughs> She had her revenge or whatever, and then she's like standing on the rooftop, and I guess she was like gonna leap. I, I don't. I still, she was. I know, yeah, but that was. scene was still very weird for me. I, that whole thing, and then all of a sudden, Yo Jong's mom just like appeared on the roof. I'm like, where the fuck did you come from? I know. Like, where, how, oh, did she, how did she? Oh get my there? god! Oh. How did you know she was there? And then she oh, you know what that is. You know what that is. <laughs> coincidence. Coincidence. That's a Deus Ex Deus, Machina. Yeah, I was going to say a Deus Ex Man. It was also like, crazy because yeah. she's like, save my son. And I'm like, this woman has led your son into like a descent of madness. Yeah, and now and you're asking like, for her help? He you know, already he, had a drawer full of knives. Yeah, but. <laughs> like, when we got to when we got to the roof and like the like averted suicide, I just realized I'm going to call it here. I hate this almost as much as the sound of magic. Not as much, not as much, but almost. I've just realized that like, as it all, like the full weight sinks in on me. The thing is, is that unlike the sound of magic, I like each of the main characters. I find each of the main characters compelling and interesting. I don't like them. Like, I don't want to have them over. No, I know what you mean. They're like, their stories, their stories were compelling. Their stories were all compelling. And so unlike Sound of Magic, I, I I will remember all these characters. And here's an interesting thing that can happen with writing sometimes. is I think you can develop very interesting characters and still fuck up the plot. And I think that's what we got here. Is each of these characters I'm curious about, I'm invested in, I will remember each of them and like their idiosyncrasies. But I'm not going to ever like this. Like it was a waste of like these really interesting, horrible characters. I mean, God damn it. Now I'm that's pissed. fair. Now I'm, just I'm mad. so sorry. I, and, and that's fair. Again, I'm not going to turn on the drama now just because my, I, I, like, I finished it thinking, okay, like, that went, that was a wild ride and I was on it. Like, I was, I was, yeah. on, I was on that train. I wasn't the conductor. I wasn't driving, but I was definitely, like, in the middle car. <laughs> and I was enjoying the craziness of it. I mean, were there parts that I didn't like? Absolutely. Like, that rooftop scene. I laughed out loud. Like I, and, and again, Song Hai Kyo, like crying on the, I didn't give a shit. I was like, do what you gotta do, girl. Like, I don't care anymore, but jump, but, don't jump. But like, I'm sorry. I, I, Jae Jun stumbling on the rooftop blinded and then getting pushed into a vat of concrete. That's <laughs> cinema. That's <laughs> cinema. I like, I, I'm sorry. I will watch that any fucking and- time. And not outright saying that it's Do Young, but just but showing he's the tie in the suit, right? You showing this, they show the tie, show the tie, the tie yes. I, like, are you? I will watch that. I'm sorry. Like, I loved it. I loved it. Him falling into concrete, Oscar, Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm with you in that. I liked it. Like, I liked Little Women in that. Same. I wasn't emotionally connected to anyone really, except for maybe Do Young and in Yu Soul. Um, I was, I like, you know, like, but I wasn't emotionally connected to obviously to the baddies and not to Dong Un. I was, like you said, I was just along for the ride and I watched it as a mock Dong and not as a smart revenge. Yeah. I was okay. And I was okay with that. 
And that's and fair, I, though. Like that, you like that's okay to want more. Yeah. Like, look, just, I think know. this was the premise. I mean, I, I don't do. feel like I was sold like something right. that was meant to be like a silly kind of like. Right, you, you got know. a bait and switch. We were sold a highbrow, a highbrow revenge drama in part one. Hundred percent, I agree with you. We were. I think it's oh. still intended to be highbrow in the back oh. half. Right. Well, it, it wasn't <laughs> to me. To me, my I think the intention was that this is meant to be taken as a serious drama. Not as, like, uh, a campy ride of revenge. I mean, yes, we I had, mean, like, the neck. No, I really, like... Yeah, I mean, no, it, it, I think it, I think it ended Mok Jong-y. Again, I freaking loved yes. it. Yes. Blind in a vat of cement, that is Mok Jong. The pencil in the neck at a funeral, and there's just yeah. fucking blood everywhere? Oh, my God. But look, if that's the case, the drama took itself to me so seriously for right. me to feel like that was the case. That's the thing. Okay. Is, I feel like when that's you fair. ask that question... Who's good? Who's evil? I think the drama's asking those questions. Whereas if this felt like it was like a mukjong, I feel like we'd be like, whatever. It's just ridiculous and enjoy like the crazy ride. I feel like this was trying to like answer some sort of like greater truths on like the human condition. It's what I felt like it was pretending to do. Like that was the vibe I got. I just kept getting a vibe like we're meant to be grappling with something here. And instead we're getting this like, you know, whatever. It's it's not whatever. I feel like there was a lot of work put into something that ended up being so pointless. Totally that, fair. That's fair. But was there anything you really liked about this drama? Yes. The characters. I thought the characters were fucking fantastic. And so each one of them, I think, was interesting. And like out of like the main, like, you know, the group of baddies, not... um. Oh God, what's his name? He's so boring. I forget his name. Yo Jong. <laughs> Yo Jung. Yeah, God, he was pointless. But I thought like Jong Un seemed interesting to me. I thought Jae Jun seemed interesting to me. Young Oh was really interesting to me. Hai Jung was interesting to me. Like Se Ra, I felt like they were all people I was like invested in, even if I thought they were bad and behaving badly. But when we got to like the abused wife partner accomplice that was boring to me it was yeah it was the baddies the baddies themselves were delightful and i did actually think that jong un was really an interesting character and i think her story would have become much more compelling to me if in the end there had been a bigger investment in the relation of her and hot dad because the hot dad's like that was a waste of a character he was, was amazing agree was. agree was I will admit the for Hyun Nam, the like extended like spousal abuse scene. I I will say that was that was a big quibble for me. What was the point? I I hate yeah. I hated it. I know. I didn't I didn't see a point. I don't know why we had to get her beat, beat shit like that was so like, bullies are I, bad. Bullies like, are bad. I guess yeah, was the point. <laughs> and like well like a an abuse of a husband who physically beats you is terrible. I'm like why am I watching this? I did like. I like the like red lipstick thing. Like I kind of love that when um Dong Gun tells like like oh I want to you know in a different life I would wear a red lipstick and I would do this. And then when Dong Gun gives her the, gives her the red lipstick and then we see yeah. her like asked to do like one more kind of mission and she like looks in the mirror and she takes out her lipstick and puts it on. I did I have to admit I like that scene. I did. Yeah, but I I would say like that I, the spousal abuse was just, I mean, I haven't dealt with it myself, but that was still triggering for me. Yeah, that was that was rough to watch. I mean, there's a lot of things that are rough to watch in this. But yeah, um, true. For some reason, that just watch- felt gratuitous, though. If, if, I, I don't mind watching things that are rough generally, as long as I feel like there's a point to it. I was going to say, it has to have a purpose. Yeah. And I want to know, story like, forward. what am I going to get as my payoff or lesson or observation or thought or takeaway from the film, even if it was difficult to watch. Is it just supposed to make us like happy when he gets run down? That's what I think. I think they really, I think they really want us to hate him. So we wouldn't be sad when he died. But I was like, but I, I wouldn't have cared either way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, why do we give it? Why do we give a shit? Like it, the whole, that whole subplot to me was completely just a pointless, another pointless subplot to fill time. Yeah. So, I mean, I was gonna say one thing that I did, I did like a lot at the end when Yun Jin is in prison and Dongan knows the story that she didn't give Myungo the fatal blow and basically just, you know, taunting Yun Jin with knowing that she doesn't know the truth. And 
you know, th- that. that's, that's like Yun Jin's like big weakness is somebody having the upper hand on her, mm-hmm. right? Like she always wants to be in control. And so yeah. that's just going to, knowing that that's going to continue to drive her mad, that there's something that she doesn't know about mm-hmm. what happened to Myung Oh. I loved that. Me too. Yeah. It's Cause it's going to haunt her for the rest of her life. I did think that that was excellent revenge. Like lo- I will admit that that scene made me very happy. So look, I like it. And I'm like, but really, like, that was the masterful revenge stroke was, like, who killed myung Oh, Like, I don't know. Like, at the end of the day, I was like... Like, who shot was, nice guy Eddie? It was good, but I was, like, really... Like, after 20 fucking years of, like, cutting out individual photos and taping them on your wall... That's I don't what know. You- the photos had nothing to do with anything. I mean, I would say that... I think she was winging it. <laughs> I mean... There was no master plan. There like, really that wasn't is, a master plan. There wasn't. Plan. Again, I know Lawless Lawyer wasn't like a favorite of you, of either of you, but like there was a master I think plan. Lawless Lawyer. Yeah, you did. There was a master plan there. I mean, it got like foiled by like the enemy, but he had a plan. He had an ultimate plan and he had, remember he had the second floor and he would like turn on the projector and that's where like all his plans would be. And those, he used that. Like they used it right, in those the drama. Were real plans. Like, those were real plans. <laughs> so like I do I to- like I totally get it. Again, I she just had like a serial killer collage. Like that's what she it did. was. But we had watched them be terrible people for so many episodes that so it was enjoyable enough for me just to watch them. Agree. I liked their unraveling. I guess we should let's briefly talk about the ending though. Because I think that so I remember in part 1 I was like, look, this could go either way like there could be some sort of like moral dilemma that Dong Un has to deal with and she has to like decide something and like maybe her morals will weigh in or something. And there was there wasn't anything like that. No. And I think that could have been an issue too with like say Leah is because there was no sort of like reckoning that she had to come up with. Her story was that she was frozen at 19 and now she gets to move on. But but her moving on is to but do her moving more on is like yeah, I mean, it's weird. It's weird. So like, I I mean, I get it. Like, I totally, but they're I mean, just the I revenge it, couple now. Yeah, well, I and I said that at the beginning, it felt indulgent. Like they were just terrible people. And Kim Eun Suk wrote terrible. She things wrote some great people. terrible people who did terrible things that the story could have used more cohesiveness. But like I said, I just, I went along for the ride. And I enjoyed it. You know, what was the like, school pervert? What was the point of that? Just to show Jay Jun beating him up, just to like cause more. I guess it was just to cause more conflict between Do Young and Jay Jun. Really, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, and why did they give him that haircut? <laughs> oh my god, that teacher! Like maybe to make maybe that's a pedophile haircut. Like I don't like, know. We all like, knew, buddy. Yeah, he was creepy. From that you were creepy. I hope yeah. that's not his real hair. All right. <laughs> no, I don't think it is. Can, give me a break. <laughs> I hope not. Anyway, I enjoyed the ride. You enjoyed the ride. Leah wanted to jump off the train. It's all good. Leah wanted to burn the train down. She wanted she to. Did. She wanted to. She blow wanted to up fill it with tra- zombies. She wanted to blow up the tracks. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed the first half, and I thought that I was on the train to a good station, and instead, I ended up like being like stuck on like i don't even know i'm like choi woo shik being eaten alive and trained to busan <laughs> like it was a buzz kill <laughs> all poor choi woo shik and, and trained Aww. to busan I oh he's like movie. baby choi well i know baby choi woo shik okay all right well l- i'm really curious what anyone what everyone else thinks of this um if you side with like kind of amy and i or if you're leah or if you're like somewhere in the middle i'm i am very very curious please let us know because the memes, I will say, of this drama are stellar. Yes. Stellar. I do like it. And I have enjoyed seeing behind the scenes clips on like the Spoon Netflix and stuff like that because it is so fun to see them all like laughing and being friends, which again just like to me reinforces like their amazing performances because Yeah, watching horrible. Yunjin with like a genuine friendly smile on her face freaks me yes. out. I know. Because <laughs> she's so she's terrifying. Terrible. I know. She is. All, All right. right. Well, thank you for listening. Megan, get off of the pod and go watch Princess Bride. Like, literally, don't even talk to us until you've watched it. 
Okay. Don't don't okay. give me that face. Like, okay, <laughs> mom. <laughs> We're gonna fucking face. watch the Princess Bride. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay. And if you if you all have something to say about Megan never having <laughs> seen the Princess Bride, please chime in. Please <laughs> chime in. It's okay. You can all roast me. Thanks, right, everyone. Guys. We will see you next time. Anyang. 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 da. Thank you for listening to Afternoon of Delight. Where can you find us outside the pod? Head on over to afternoonadelight.com. That's A F T E R N O O N A D E L I G H T dot com. You'll find links to all our social media, our book recs, K pop and K skincare recs, and if you want even more Afternoon of Delight, because really who doesn't, you can join our Patreon, where you can choose the patron level that's right for you. Join in daily K drama conversations, listen to bonus podcast episodes just for patrons, and participate in our monthly live K drama support group via Zoom. We can't wait for you to be a part of the community. Until next time, Annyeong!